Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Parish Unitarian Universalist of Arlington. My name is Danny Dakota, and I'm glad to be with you today, serving as your volunteer worship associate. If this is one of your first times with us, please reach out to tell me more at firstparish.info to connect with our greeter, Susan Moore, during our service. Please also see the announcements posted on the Zoom chat this morning. There are many events coming up in our vibrant community. We don't know what this week will bring, but do join us Wednesday at 6.30 for worship, reflection, and community as we process the election together. This afternoon at three o'clock, Reverend Erica Richman, one of our ministers at First Parish, will co-lead a training on preparing for mass protests in November and beyond. It will include skills training on how to serve as a safety marshal for rallies, marches, and de-escalation teams. You can RSVP to Reverend Erica to get the Zoom link at erica at firstparish.info. We have two special online musical offerings this week. On Thursday evening, Fabiola Mendez performs Puerto Rican folk tunes, Latin jazz favorites, and more. On Saturday evening, Diane Taraz presents a vocal instrumental program on the theme of thankfulness. And the Pie Palace lives. The Social Justice Committee is taking commitments from bakers on homemade pies, which will be sold to support social justice. Details and sign up information can be found in the news section online. Details about all of these events and others can be found at www.firstparish.info. The sun rose at 618 this morning and will set at 438 this afternoon. The days grow shorter and the light becomes wan and thin. Last night, little ghouls and witches roamed the frozen streets while flickering jack-o'-lanterns signaled where to find candy. Today is All Saints Day in some Christian traditions, and tomorrow is All Souls Day, three days to mark the closeness of the spirit world to ours and the bonds that persist unbroken between them. Three days to honor souls wherever they wander, brushing the edges of our dreams. Here, we might be taught with worry over the next few days and months ahead. Contradictions abound, as stark as snow on green leaf trees and the still blooming flowers. We face the challenge of these days of uncertainty together. We light our chalice today for courage. We light it knowing each flame is a mute prayer for strength, resilience, communion with each other, and the presence felt but unseen. We light it as people have always done, for hope against the gathering dark. Good morning. I am Reiner Dresser, one of the volunteer lay ministers at First Parish. Anytime worship brings people together, we all bring our sorrows and joys. Sharing what is in our hearts brings us together as a community. At this time, if you have a candle, I invite you to light it and place it where all can see the glow. As you light it, think about one matter on your heart. For instance, you may light it for a gratitude, a grief, a celebration, or a hope. Each candle holds whatever matter you bring to it. While we are all in our separate living spaces, we join in this unifying act, watching a sea of candles come to life in our screens in prayer. After you have lit your candle, you are welcome to share your joy or concern in the chat box. We ask that you keep in mind that this is a public worship service and anyone in this Zoom meeting can see what you post. The list of joys and concerns will be distributed among our lay ministers who will continue to hold them in their prayers in the days ahead. Let us begin sharing our cares and our prayers 
and let us keep them named as well as unnamed in our hearts in the coming days.
Good morning. I'm Reverend Erica, your parish minister, and alongside Marta, it is an honor to serve all of you. As Danny said so beautifully, we are in a time of wandering memories, both those past and those to be created. Tomorrow is All Souls Day, and we are two days away from the election. We are facing a week of anticipation, uncertainty, and for some of us, fear. Knowing all this and seeing all of our joys and sorrows in the chat box, let us enter into a moment of prayer. Taking a deep breath, relaxing clenched hands, maybe closing your eyes if just for a moment and inviting a sacred and holy presence into our mists. Gracious and loving spirit, be with us now. As the veil between this world and the next becomes thin, let us draw upon the strength of our ancestors those who are those great, great, great relatives who we never met, and those who are freshly missing, those in our community who recently passed. All of those ancestors, we bring them to the forefront. Those who fought and struggled so that we might have more more freedom, more choice, more connection, more love. Let us imagine that love moving through the ages, a warm ball of energy born of ancient times, radiating through our bodies now strengthening us for the week ahead. History teaches us so much. Those who have gone before us have grieved and mourned, faced illness. May we tap into their wisdom, to their resilience. May that energy of perseverance radiate through our bodies now. For those ancestors who are artists, the creative ones, who carved out hope when hope was hard to find, we say thank you. May that life-giving energy blossom within us when we feel stuck, helpless, or alone. For those ancestors who sang, danced, and laughed through despair, who built community and said yes to one another, may we feel that silver sliver of joy this morning. May that energy of delight, however small, radiate and grow throughout our bodies. In this moment, as we settle into silence, I invite us to lift up a prayer, be it a gratitude, a concern, or a petition. And imagine handing that prayer over to an ancestor known or unknown. May they carry us through the week ahead. Our two minutes of shared silence will begin and end with the singing bowl.
Each week, we live our faith through acts of generosity. Our virtual offering goes to support the work of this congregation and to an outside organization. We split our pot, so to speak, and this month we are giving to the Wheelchair Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading an international effort to promote the joy of giving, create global friendship, and deliver a wheelchair to everyone who needs one but cannot afford one. At least 100 million children, teens, and adults worldwide are in this position. Wheelchair Foundation distributes them via a network of NGOs that have ongoing humanitarian missions. Wheelchairs are sent to developing countries around the world from a list of 152 nations, many of them landmine countries in Asia and Africa. Wheelchairs are specifically designed for those various terrains. Wheelchairs are also distributed in the US to those in need. They offer hope, mobility, and independence. There are many ways to give to our congregation and we thank you for your financial contributions this morning. I have the pleasure of introducing today's Time for All Ages. And I think you'll see why I'm excited about it in just a minute. The last four years have been, I'll just say strange. It is an unusual time in the life of this country. And you have probably heard the grown-ups in your life worrying a lot more than maybe they used to about politics and who's president. You've maybe had these conversations with your friends too. It is election season and it comes to an end on Tuesday when everyone who can and who wants to will have cast their ballot for who will be president and also for senators and representatives and all sorts of elected positions throughout the country. Sometimes we can feel discouraged about politics. Sometimes grown-ups can feel like change is too hard and that there are too many bad laws and we can't possibly fix them. When that happens, it's important to remember what America is about. The idea of America and the promise of it. Ours is a country that people have come to from all over the world and they make it their own and this country has room for all of it to grow, to change and to become better. Because it can be hard to remember this sometimes, we wanted to share a poem with you that reminds us. It's called Let America Be America Again by a poet named Langston Hughes. He was an American poet. He was a black man born at the very beginning of the last century in 1902. He lived an unusual life. He lived in six different American cities before he was 12. By the time his first book was published, he had already been a truck driver, a farmer, a cook, a waiter, a sailor, a college graduate, and a doorman at a nightclub in Paris. We have 13 wonderful people from First Parish reading this poem together. Beautiful, familiar faces that I know I have missed seeing. We edited it down because it's kind of a long poem, but it is a reminder. And on this Sunday before a very momentous election Tuesday, we hope it reminds you all of what a special, complicated and wondrous country this is and what it is we are all fighting for. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive or tyrant scheme, that anyone be crushed by one above. It never was America to me.
Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath. But opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. Yet I'm the one who's dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turned, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the one who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left Dark Ireland shore in Poland's plain in England's grassy lea. And torn from Black Africa's strand I came to build a homeland of the free. Oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet, and yet must be. The land where every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain from those who live like leeches on other people's lives. We must take back our land again. America, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states, and make America again. How wonderful to see your faces and the convictions of this religious community, especially this Sunday before an election. Thank you to those who participated and spoke. Thanks to the worship associates behind the scenes and especially Danny and Joe Guthrie for weaving our voices together. It is a custom in worship to pass the peace, to greet those with us. Worshiping online, we do this with breakout rooms. We will be randomly placed in a breakout room with a half dozen others or so. The members of each group will have six minutes to introduce themselves and answer the day's question. Please share briefly and from the heart so that each person can speak. This week, one of you said that you were feeling like the news comes over you like a tsunami. At times you feel caught in the sheer power of destruction, the magnitude of which can seem so overwhelming. And so today I ask each of us to consider what experience this week was sustaining to your spirit? What moment brought you some respite or reassurance, peace, comfort, perspective or inspiration. What experience this week was sustaining to your spirit?
Welcome back. Welcome back to worship as one large group together. Millions of people have already voted. They have sent in ballots. They have waited in line for hours. In Texas, one voter played a saxophone while he waited. In Milwaukee, another handed out pizza. In New York, voters stood in the rain, masked and sharing umbrellas with strangers. Last Sunday, we posted the names of more than 70 of you who have helped get out the vote. I'd like to ask for a show of hands now. If you phoned voters to get out the vote, raise your hand and keep it up. If you sent postcards to voters, raise your hand. If you encouraged a friend or family member to vote, raise your hand. And if you voted, raise your hand. Each vote, each action you take, perhaps beyond your comfort zone, is a stand against hopelessness, complacency, and cynicism. It is standing up and standing with people who have touched your heart, stories and circumstances that have changed you and stayed with you. Your vote, your getting out the vote, is an act of love. Millions have voted. Millions more are expected to exercise this right and this responsibility of citizenship. I am hopeful because I choose to see the early turnout and voter engagement like a mustard seed, a moment filled with immense possibility. And yet, and yet, I also know that the president has repeatedly refused to commit to a peaceful transfer of power if he loses. Widespread and peaceful demonstrations successfully halted coups in Serbia in 2000, in Ukraine in 2004, and in Gambia in 2016. Political scientists tell us that widespread nonviolent demonstrations in cities, in suburbs, and in rural areas are the number one antidote to any unlawful holding of power. And so this afternoon at three, Reverend Erica Richmond will co-lead a workshop on preparing for safe mass protests. If you'd like to attend, email erica at firstparish.info with a Zoom link. Now, these are not things I thought I would ever announce in a worship service in this country. Whatever may or may not happen, on the day after election day, we will gather online for prayer and worship, sharing and music. Join us Wednesday evening from 6.30 to 7.30. A little bit ago, we heard a poem read in part by several of you. The poem dates to 1935, a time of enormous economic and political turmoil, fraught with underlying racism and class division. During such a time, the poet writes, let America be America again. And I wonder, when was America, America to you? In that public school, Friday was assembly. It meant on Fridays, all the children gathered in the auditorium or assembly for may have been an hour. The principal addressed the students. 
and there would be a presentation or perhaps a performance by a theater group or a musician. The children were to be well behaved, not make noise and not kick their heels against the back under the seats. Among the parents of those children was a firefighter, a tailor, a Holocaust survivor, and a man many suspected was in the mafia. Among the parents was a house cleaner, a television sports producer, and a mother who went to mass every morning. Among the parents was an engineer who designed transformers and two immigrants from China who did not speak a word of English and lived above the laundry where they washed, ironed, and folded clothes. They then wrapped in brown paper and tied with string for their customers to pick up. On Friday morning, all these parents sent their children to school in white shirts, navy pants, or skirts. Everyone knew Friday was assembly. When was America, America to you? I think of the poet's words. Langston Hughes was the descendant of slaves as well as slave owners. He was a literary genius and a pillar of the Harlem Renaissance, a great intellectual, social, and artistic explo explosion centered in Harlem in the 1920s. And though a leading figure in the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes throughout his life barely eked out a living, battling persistent racism, selling a poem or a story, every few months. He called himself a literary sharecropper. And he wrote, let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. And then the poet declares in parentheses, that America was never America to me. And in those parentheses lies the poem's power. When was America, America to you? Langston Hughes speaks of the freedom and equality hoped for, but never received. He writes in the poem, let America be America again. I am the poor, white, fooled, and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek. And only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. Millions on relief today, millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay, yet I am the one who dreamt our basic dream. Despite the suffering, despite the injustice, the poet believes in, dreams of an America to be, and America still in the making, let America be the dream, the dreamer's dream. Again, I ask you, when was America, America to you? Where in your memories lie the glimmers of that dream? Yesterday, I met with more than a dozen people who are considering joining First Parish, four or five of them having only discovered us online, never having actually been in the meeting house. Bonnie Zimmer organized this new UU Unitarian Universalist class online. Reverend Erica was there as well. It fell to me to talk about what we believe, what we treasure as 
Unitarian Universalists. On the weekend before an election, I wanted to tell them we gather in religious community, not as partisans, not as followers of any particular candidate. There are other gatherings for that. Instead, here we gather seeking the larger perspective, deeper and longer in its arc through history. We gather seeing America as simply the place we've landed to live out certain values we have staked our faith on. This is what I told them, five things we treasure as Unitarian Universalists. First, this is a non-creedal faith, faith not wed to the particulars of dogma, to any one right answer to questions like, is there a God? What is that God like? Or what happens after this life? We have known through history the dangers of such certainty. And so we cultivate within ourselves the ability to wonder, as well as an ability to sit beside those with other takes, other views on the most important of questions. Which brings me to a second defining aspect of liberal religion, humility. We practice humility when it comes to the mysteries of life and death. We abhor the arrogance of certainty when it comes to religious questions. And therefore we create room for multiple perspectives. For we know that people with views other than our own expand our minds and our hearts. Thirdly, we affirm the idea of continuous revelation. Truth is not a closed book. Continuously unfolding in our midst, in discoveries of science, in the wonders of nature, as well as in ancient wisdom. We employ the power of reason and the call of compassion in evaluating what may be true. And we see such examination as fiercely necessary if goodness and justice and well-being are to prevail. Fourth, we believe that human nature holds more good than evil, that within you and I lies an inherent goodness. There is within us more blessedness than sinfulness. Namaste. I bow to the divine in you. I see within you a divine spark. And fifth and finally, this goodness in the other calls us to act, calls us to act in love toward the stranger, the wounded and the vulnerable, the kept down and the kept out, the beaten and the misunderstood. We call this standing on the side of love. We call this the work of justice. We call this giving shape to the beloved community here on earth. This is what I said in the new UU class. I want them and all of us to remember that we will have our differences about economic policy, legislative agendas, the nature of police reform, or particular approaches to climate justice. But we bring to all such discussions a suspicion of the one right and sure answer, a sense of our own view as limited, of the breadth of places truth may be found and tested, of the worth and goodness at the heart of every person, and the need to protect and call forth that goodness in all people. Martin Luther King said, the church must be reminded that it is, that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather 
the conscience of the state. And together in religious community, we cultivate our sense of conscience. Our country is at a low point, yet there are signs of change. Polls show a stunning increased awareness of discrimination against people of color in our country, and people say there is a need for change. The police killing of George Floyd in May set off what may be the biggest wave of protest in U.S. history. An estimated 15 to 26 million Americans took to the streets and protests extended into small town and rural America. And into the fall, the majority of Americans continued to support Black Lives Matter. Our country is at a low point, and yet this may also portend a turning point. Historians and social scientists speak of plastic hours, rare but transformative moments in history and societies when the right alignment of public opinion, political power and events usually in the midst of some major crisis, gives way to enormous change. Are we living in a plastic hour? Maybe so. In his new book, The Upswing, political scientist George Putnam charts waves or cycles of movement toward change and reform in American history. Like other times that have preceded an upswing, we are experiencing a national crisis, the pandemic. And like then, we are also living with enormous economic inequity. And we are living with a dynamic younger generation, which is inflamed by the wrongs and injustice dealt in our world their world. Our country is at a low point, and perhaps that itself is a sign of hope. I ask you, when was America, America to you? One Friday, the day the children wore their white shirts and their navy skirts and pants, the fourth grade class was to recite poetry in assembly. Each child was to select a poem and have the experience of speaking before all their classmates sitting in the wooden seats of the auditorium. One girl went to the school library, took a few thin books of poetry from the shelves, and sat on the linoleum floor looking for a poem. She wanted it to be short. She wanted it to be a poem that wasn't too complicated. She wanted it to be something she could understand. Not all poetry is understood by someone in the fourth grade. The poem began, I too sing America by Langston Hughes. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. And the girl are the times she and her brothers had to eat in the kitchen when the company came how shut out she felt from whatever good things the adults must be doing and eating and talking about. The poem continued, but tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, 
shall see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. That girl's skin was the color of Cheerios, oatmeal, and cooked chicken. She was white, Norwegian, Irish, English. Little did she understand the particular depths behind the words of the poet. But bridges between people arrive out of wellsprings of empathy that is well cultivated. Perhaps this Sunday, before an election, I am trying to say something about love. Not love as sentiment, but love as a commitment to a particular way of living, a way of living that is unselfish, even sacrificial, a way of living that seeks the good and the well-being of others, as well as the self. Call it the commonweal, the common good. It is a love that saints and prophets have called for through the ages, a beloved community. Tuesday is election day. As people of faith, we believe Every person's inherent worth entitles them to a voice in our democracy. Every vote is sacred. Every eligible voter should be heard, even if it takes longer than expected. We must make sure that election officials fulfill their responsibility to count every vote. When election officials take the time to count and verify every ballot, that is a sign that our democracy is working, that love is working. I close with words of our poet today, Langston Hughes. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states. Oh, let America be America again, land that never has been yet, and yet must be. Amen. It's our custom when we are incarnate to hold hands and to place our hand on one another's shoulders for the benediction. So if you're with somebody, you may take their hand. And if not, please place your hands around yourself, perhaps on your shoulders, and feel the embrace of the universe. And repeat these words after me. May faith in the spirit of life May faith in the spirit of life. Hope for the community of earth. Hope for the community of earth. And love of the sacred in one another. And love of the sacred in one another. Be ours now and in all the days to come. 
be ours now and in all the days to come. Amen. Amen. <laughs>